Hi and welcome to this video on computing the Fourier series coefficients of the signal absolute value of sine 2 pi t. Now, in the first class of this week, we looked at how to compute the Fourier series coefficients of a periodic square wave. In particular, when the duty cycle of this periodic square wave was 50%, that is the square wave was on for half the time period and off for the remaining half, we noticed that only the odd harmonics survived and the even harmonics were all zero, right? Of course, you could also have a DC component, that is a zero frequency component, based on the average value of the periodic square wave. Now, today we are going to look at a different periodic signal, which is absolute value of sine 2 by t, and figure out what the Fourier coefficients are for such a signal. Okay. In particular, we are interested in figuring out the a case that set in the Fourier series expansion of x of t. Okay. So note that this is the Fourier series expansion of x of t, where we express x of t as a linear combination of basic building blocks, right? And these building blocks are periodic complex exponentials whose frequencies are all integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. Okay, so before we get started with computing the Fourier series coefficients using these expressions that we derived in the class, let's first sketch the signal x of t so we get an idea on what the time period, fundamental time period of x of t is. Okay, so I'm quickly going to sketch x of t over here. And as you can see, x of t is absolute value of sine 2 by t, so it's non-negative always, and the maximum value it takes is 1, and it takes the value of 1 at 1 over 4 time unit, and 1 half plus 1 over 4, etc. right? So by looking at the signal, you can easily see that the time period of the signal is 1 half, right? The fundamental time period of the signal is 1 half, and the fundamental frequency of the signal is 2 pi divided by 1 half, which is 4 pi. Okay, now we figure out what omega naught is in this expansion. Our next step is then to compute the Fourier series coefficients. That is the a0 and the a case for all non-zero k. Okay, so let's get started with a0 first. a0, as we know, is simply the average value of the signal over one time period, right? And this average value over a time period of half units is given by one over one half times the integral of the signal over one time period. So I could choose this time period between 0 to 1 half. All right. Now, when t lies between 0 and 1 half, the absolute value of sine t okay, is exactly same as sine itself. right? So the absolute value of sine 2 by t is equal to sine 2 by t when t lies between 0 and half. So I can get rid of this absolute value okay, and then write that absolute value of sine 2 by t equals sine 2 by t when t lies in this interval. This allows me to simplify the integral. Okay, I can next write that a0 is 2 times integral 0 to 1 half sine 2 by t dt. Okay? Now, what's the integral of the sine function? It is the negative cosine function. right? So, I'm going to use that next, that the integral of sine is negative cosine, and I'm going to substitute limit 0 and 1 half. Okay? So, the factor of 2 pi shows up over here in the denominator because we are integrating not just sine t, but sine of, say, a t, where a is 2 pi, right? So the factor that shows up in of t appears in the denominator after integration, right? Now, we got to substitute limits 0 and half in cosine 2 pi t, okay? Now, this requires us to know what cosine of 2 pi times half is and what is cosine of 0, right? And these are really straightforward. So cosine of pi minus cosine of 0. So cosine pi is minus 1 and cosine 0 is 1 and you have a factor of minus 1 over pi outside. So this makes a0 equals 2 over pi, right? Now, a0 is the average value of the signal over one time period, and it makes sense that it is 2 over pi, right? So let's take a look at our signal itself. It's absolute value of sine 2 pi t, right? Now, the average value is likely to be somewhere over here, right? Now, the sine function has higher concentration about 1 than 0, right? So I would naturally expect the average of such a function to be above 1 half, right? And of course, it needs to be below 1 because 1 is the maximum value achieved by sine 2 pi t over this period, okay? And if you compute 2 over pi, okay, uh, you're going to get something close to 0 0.66, which is clearly above half, okay? So a0 is 2 over pi, and now we got to figure out the remaining 
Fourier series coefficients. That is the a case for k not equal to zero. So a k is given by this expression that we derived in the class, and the way we interpreted this expression is that a k is the average value of x of t divided by e to the j k omega naught t, right? So a k basically tells you what is the strength of e to the j k omega naught t within my periodic signal x of t. All right. Now we know that omega naught in this problem is 4 pi because the time period is half. So just plug in omega naught to 4 pi over here and setting x of t equals absolute value of sine 2 pi t, we get this term, right? And once again, we go with the same argument that the absolute value of sine 2 pi t is exactly same as sine 2 pi t when t lies between 0 and 1 half, all right? And this gives us the expression shown here, okay? Now, you could simplify this integral in multiple ways, right? You could use uh, the rule that integral uv is u integral v minus integral of differential of u times integral of v, right? Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to express sine 2 pi t as a combination of periodic complex exponentials, right? And that's something that we've seen in the class today as well. So I can write sine theta as e to the j theta minus e to the minus j theta upon 2j, all right? So sine 2 pi t is e to the j 2 pi t minus e to the minus j 2 pi t upon 2j, okay? Now I can factor these terms out and I can cut, express this integral as a combination of two integrals. Okay, I pulled out uh, the one over two j as well and canceled the two. So that gave me one over j, right? Now, what is the integral of the exponential function? It's really easy, right? We've seen in the class multiple times that integral of e to the alpha x dx is e to the alpha x upon alpha, right? So in this case, this is your alpha, right? And the integral of such an exponential function is the exponential itself divided by the coefficient that sits in front of the variable over which we are integrating, okay? So I can use this property for both of these integrals. And then I get this, okay? Then I substitute the lower and upper limits in this expression, okay? That gives me this, all right? Now, at this point, we need to figure out what e to the j times 2 pi minus 4 pi k times 1 half is, right? So I can express e to the alpha plus beta as e to the alpha times e to the beta, right? So I can decompose this exponential as a product of two exponentials that are given by this expression, right? And this one as well is expressed as a product of two exponentials. Now we need to know what e to the j pi is. Okay, and what e to the minus j 2 pi k is for any integer k. Okay, now these terms are something that we've already seen in the class, right? So let's check what e to the j pi is. So in the polar domain, if I have the real dimension on the horizontal axis and the imaginary dimension on the vertical axis, you know that e to the j theta is a vector that makes an angle theta in the anticlockwise direction with the positive real axis, right? So what is e to the j pi? So e to the j pi is a vector that makes an angle of pi with the positive real axis, okay? Which means the tip of the vector lies over here and the vector is nothing but minus one, right? And what is e to the minus j 2 pi k? So e to the minus j 2 pi k is a vector Okay, can be represented by a vector that makes an angle of minus two pi k. Now, when k is an integer, two pi times k is a multiple of 360 degrees, right? It's an integer multiple of 360 degrees, okay? So when I rotate this vector starting at zero, say 360 degree by 360 degree or 720 degree, et cetera, they all fall on top of the same vector, which is one plus j zero, right? So e to the j two pi k is one, and the conjugate of that, which is e to the minus j two pi k is also plus one right for all k in the set of integers okay now recall that for Fourier series coefficients we got to figure out a k is where k is an integer right so i can make use of these two identities e to the j pi equals minus one and e to the minus j two pi k equals plus one into the above expression and what i get is one over j square times minus one minus one by two pi minus four pi k plus other terms right now, j square is minus one, so I have that, right? And then I can cancel the negative sign over here and there, and I get this, right? I factor out the one over pi, and I get that, okay? 
and then I can simplify this further to write a k equals 1 over pi times 2 upon 1 minus 4k squared, right? Or equivalently, a k is 2 over pi times 1 minus 4k squared, okay? Now, let's try to interpret how these a k's look like, okay? So, we are given x of t. It's a time domain periodic signal. And we figured out the Fourier series coefficients. That is the a k's for all k's in the in set of integers, okay? For k equals 0, we figured out that a0 is 2 over pi. For k equals 1, you're going to get a1 equals 2 over pi times 1 minus 4 times 1, which is minus 2 over 3 pi, all right? For k equals 2, you're going to get minus 2 over 15 pi. k equals 3, you're going to get minus 2 over 35 pi, all right? So you can notice from the sketch that a k is positive for k equals 0 and it's negative for all the other k's, all right? Now let's try to see whether this combination of a k's makes sense from uh, the properties that we studied uh, in the class, okay? So in our class, we said that whenever x of t is a real valued signal, right? So x of t must be equal to its complex conjugate for all time, right? And for this property to hold true, the condition that must be satisfied is that a minus k should be equal to a k star for all k. That is, the spectral component at the negative harmonic minus k omega naught should be equal to the spectral component at the corresponding positive harmonic plus k omega naught conjugated, right? So if you look at the set of a k's that we obtained over here, a minus one is minus two over three pi, and that's also the same as a1 conjugate, which is minus 2 over 3 pi conjugate, right? Because a conjugate of a real number is the same real number, right? So this property is clearly met given the fact that x of t is a real valued signal. It does not have any complex components here, right? And if you stare at x of t for a while, you'd also realize that x of t is also an even signal, right? And for even signal, we know that x of minus t should be equal to x of t for all time, right? And the equivalent condition in the Fourier domain is that a minus k should be equal to a k for all k, right? That is the spectral component at minus k omega naught should be equal to the spectral component at k omega naught for every k, right? And this is indeed true because a k depends on k through k square, right? So whether it's plus k square or negative k square, you get the same a k, right? So this concludes uh, the computation of the Fourier series coefficients. Okay, now you could uh, generate this signal in Python or MATLAB, just play out such an audio on your computer and you could use the Android apps that we've seen in today's class to check whether the Fourier coefficients that you see in the app are consistent with what you observed here. Okay, so take that as an exercise and see you in the session later.